Good morning, friends. Boo. Okay, so I was reading articles this week about the science of surprise. In fact, before I started looking and reading, <clears throat> I didn't even know there was a science of surprise. Now, what I just did to you, the boo, kind of, that kind of a shock, is on the surpri surprise spectrum, but it's not the only kind. So apparently, when we are surprised, we all freeze for one twenty-fifth of a second. Then our brains go into overdrive to take in all of the information around us and figure out <clears throat> what it was that just caught us by surprise, be it something shocking or a revelation that we weren't anticipating. We become completely focused on the moment. And then we enter what surprise researchers call the shift, where a change in our thinking occurs. This means either we notice something new about our surroundings or we take in new information that we didn't have before or we now realize in a new way. And then typically we want to share our surprise and the re revelation that followed. <clears throat> now there's some fun experiments uh, that I read about in the study of surprise. One had uh, people getting a small shot of tasty juice and water at regular intervals while under observation of an fMRI machine. The other group got random shots of the tasty juice and water <clears throat> while also in the machine. Now the, the scientists assumed that every time you got uh, the tasty juice, the, um, uh, sorry, the um, uh, happy place in your brain would light up. Uh, but what they found is that the surprise group had significantly higher activity in the reward center of their brains than the predictable group had. One study even claimed that our, emotion, our emotions intensify up to 400% when we are surprised, which includes our happy surprises, our sad surprises, and our angry surprises. This is a big part of how we learn and why those aha moments <clears throat> stick so well in our memories. They, it's not just a, a taking in of new information. Those moments of surprise, the, the surprise element helps those moments stick in our memory. Not only do surprises make us feel better, they can also help us to learn. And now there are new industries popping up to capitalize on this new research. One company lets you sign up to receive random gifts in the mail at odd intervals. Or you can sign up to go on adventures where you just show up not knowing anything about what's about to happen to you. <clears throat> they even have a kit that they will send you to help you surprise your family members more often. I'm assuming in good ways that create the happy response and not in the bad way like with a rubber snake under your pillow or something like that. That would not be a happy surprise. Another article I read championed the benefits of surprises in our relationships to help keep them strong and vibrant, saying that you should surprise your spouse at least once a week to keep your marriage strong. Now, I'm just reporting what I found. I'm not advocating for that necessarily, but you do know how a fun surprise can make a big difference, like when your spouse randomly brings you a cup of coffee in the morning or unloads the dishwasher or cleans the sink or brings a flower in from the garden. Those kinds of surprises make us happy and we remember them. In our Old Testament reading this morning, Jacob gets a surprise when he goes to sleep and God visits him in a dream. The scripture says he laid down a big stone and put it under his head. That's a firm pillow. Some say that the Hebrew there can be translated to mean that he put stones around him to keep him safe while he slept, and that makes a lot more sense to me. So he's in what the scripture says is a certain place. It wasn't a significant place until God made it one by showing up. And he's asleep when in his dream he sees a ladder or a stairway that goes from earth to heaven or from heaven to earth, depending on your perspective. <clears throat> and there are angels ascending and descending on it. And then Jacob realizes God is next to him saying, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and to your offspring. And your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth. 
and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the and to the south and all the families of the earth shall be blessed in you and in your offspring know that i am with you and i will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land for i will not leave you until i have done what i have promised you wow that is a cool dream and once again we hear god articulating the promise of land and offspring to abraham's children so that all of the families of the earth can be blessed in them and in his children it's so easy to, to skip over that part, right? And to just think about Jacob, who will eventually be called Israel, as one of God's favorites and part of an exclusive family. It can be easy to seem like God is setting up a particular people group to love and empower over everyone else in the world, but always they were to be a blessing, a priesthood, an avenue to God's love for the rest of the world. And they forgot that, often, to their own de detriment. And we do too. It's easy to think of Christians as being God's favorite. After all, we are the ones who follow God's Son and <clears throat> do the things that we assume God wants for all of humanity. But aren't we also chosen to be servants or priests or avenues of God's light to the rest of the world. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and give his life. Now, when we understand our role in the world as elites, as God's favorites, we're, we're drawn towards power. And the more the better, because we believe that we're the only ones who can rightly order society in the way God wants it. And we've seen how focusing on amassing power at all costs to do God's work with it <clears throat> can create enormous blind spots in any religious community. We've watched in the last several years the Southern Baptist community divide over this very practice where they shame and shun their own ethicists who dares to criticize the president for his moral and ethical failures. We've seen unbelievable theological gymnastics performed by preachers who try to justify their open-mouthed, non-critical adulation of people in power who have clearly violated the ethics and the morals that they claim to uphold. And it makes sense. Right? If, if you think you're God's favorite and that only you can guide the world in the way God ordered it, shouldn't you try to get as much power as possible and use that influence? But where is the servant in that model? Where is the imitation of Jesus who did not cozy up to power, but rather called it out where it was in violation of God's will for the world, even when that power was the church? No one gets a free pass. We have always been picked or selected or chosen to serve the world, to minister to the world, to be priests unto all nations. Not kings, not a ruling class, not lords, but rather servants. Avenues of God's blessing to everyone. We cannot forget, again, God's choosing is not an end in and of itself. It is a calling. It is a commissioning. It's a vocation of service and submission to the demands of the gospel, sacrificial love of God and of our neighbors, without exception. Jacob wakes up from his dream saying, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I didn't know it. And he was afraid or in awe. And he said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. And this is the gate of heaven. He was surprised by God's presence in that certain place. And it made an impression on him. This was a teachable moment in his life <clears throat> because he realized God was with him in a place and in a way that he didn't expect. 
And just like surprise science is finding out, Jacob wanted to share this surprise, so he erected the stone and named this place the house of God. When have you been surprised by God's presence? Jacob didn't expect to find God right next to him in a place that was between places, and often we don't either. See, we can assume that we're going to find God at church, and perhaps only at church, and so we just wait to go to church until we need to fill up again or until we need another booster of God's presence. Of course, now that we cannot come to the church building, I hope and pray that we are realizing God's presence has never been confined to the beauty of our sanctuary, but is with us in surprising ways, now in our living rooms and in our kitchens and in our backyards where we turn on our device and connect with others in fellowship and in worship. Surely the Lord is in this place and we didn't know it. Before March, I would not have thought that I could have a fulfilling worship experience on a phone or on a tablet or on a television screen. But I have been so wonderfully surprised by God's presence inhabiting home, inhabiting home and office worship. And I pray that that has been true for you too. Pre-quarantine, I didn't have eyes to see God's presence at HEB necessarily. But there's something about this season that has made me more aware more attuned to the Holy Spirit whenever I'm somewhere public. I don't know if it's wearing a mask makes me more contemplative. I don't know if it's the fact that being um, in a public place has a potential danger and that heightens my senses. I don't know what it is, but I keep feeling these wonderful, surprising moments where I sense God's presence in places where I just wasn't paying attention before. Now, I believe that God was present in all of those places, before. So I'm not saying this is a new thing for God. I'm saying this is a new thing for me. I'm waking up in so many ways and realizing surely the Lord is in this place. And I didn't know it. Jacob is in awe or reverent fear as he is surprised by God's presence. I sense that now as well. I'd walked in and by the park that's near the suspension bridge too many times to count, but I didn't sense God's presence there until a month ago when we were at a rally for racial equality and justice. Surely the Lord was in that place before too, but I didn't know it. And there is an awe and a wonder associated with these surprises, seeing ordinary ground transformed into holy ground. Now, I knew holy ground before, but it was because we'd set it apart for that purpose. But now, like Jacob, I see God's presence is in all of these different places that weren't even places before, at least not places of significance. But now, they're transformed. They're made made sacred by God's presence. Are you finding God present in your life in some surprising places? Has your living room been transformed into a sanctuary? And does that change the way you inhabit that particular space? Is your backyard now holy ground because that's where you sit and feel the presence of God in ways you might not have noticed before? Friends, it can happen anywhere. It happens everywhere. We just aren't always aware. God is with you, right where you are. Scattered as we are right now, we say with Jacob, surely the Lord is in this place and in your place and in their place. God is with you, always. One of the many things I love about communion is the transformation of the ordinary into the sacred. We take bread, something we can so easily and readily take for granted in our lives. It's just bread. But when we slow down, 
when we pray, when we remember, we wake up in a sense and we realize this bread is now sacred, not because it was baked in a sacred place, not because it came from some kind of holy grains, not because it was prepared by priestly hands, but because it serves as a conduit to remember God's presence. It becomes sacred bread, a sacrament, a holy object used by God to remind us of God's love, God's grace, and God's presence, and to remind us of our connection with one another. So we wake up to this moment together, and we say as we take this bread in our hands and we break it, remembering that on the night he was betrayed, Jesus took ordinary bread and he blessed it and he broke it saying, this is my body for you. the body of Christ for you. We also take this cup, plain and ordinary, but transformed by the presence of God into a sacred vessel, a holy object used to remind us that Jesus also took an ordinary cup filled with ordinary wine and he gave thanks and he proclaimed, this is the blood of the new covenant. As often as you drink of it, remember me.
the blood of Christ, the cup of salvation. Amen. My sisters and brothers, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the face of the risen Christ shine upon you and may the Holy Spirit well up within you and give you peace until we are connected again. Amen.